Japón. worship our great God this morning. Are you grateful to be together to celebrate him? 
Yes, let's thank Him for His goodness, for His greatness, His faithfulness today. He alone is worthy of our praise. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul.
This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive. And we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lives here high. With all creation crying out. We praise. singing we praise you amen amen you may be seated we have a great opportunity today to to pray for some of our, our fellow church members who are getting ready to head out on mission and so i want to invite our, our cuban missions team to come on up to the front for a moment and as they're making their way up here we're excited uh, there's been a, a long journey of different details and, and situations that have have uh you know delayed our, our opportunity to send these people to Cuba, but it's happening, and the Lord has work for them, and we're excited about what he's prepared for them, and so uh, what I'm going to do is just read a few passages of scripture, uh, but I want to invite anybody who desires to to come and lay hands on these people as well as we read these passages and as we pray over them. Uh, maybe a few church members, some of our pastors, if you guys want to come on up, uh, and I'll, I'll guide you by just reading these prayers that Paul invites to be prayed for him while he's on mission. Uh, and then I'll allow you guys to have some opportunity to pray in alignment with these requests as well. So this comes from Colossians chapter four, starting in verse two. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message. In Ephesians 6, verse 19, Paul says, Pray for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 1. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 2. Pray too that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people for not everyone is a believer. In 
Father, we pray, we pray in alignment with these scriptures, these requests that come from missionaries uh, in the first century. Uh, Lord, for our own who we are sending out, we pray, God, that you would open doors to the gospel message, that uh, right now you've been preparing people's hearts and, and stirring within them a desire to respond to, to something, uh, and that the message that will be carried by these people will give them the opportunity to respond to that good news. Lord, that you are, are uh, um, helping the Holy Spirit to move not only in our lives, but in the lives of those who are in Cuba, um, to give them opportunities to hear, to remove barriers to the word. Lord, we pray that you would help these people in front of us to boldly proclaim that word, to fearlessly make it known, as the scriptures say, to, to pray that, um, or to, to overcome any fear that they have and and overcome any of the forces that might hinder their speaking of the gospel, Lord, but that they would be boldly empowered by your spirit to proclaim what you promise we will witness to as followers of you. God, we pray that, that the word as it's proclaimed will spread, that it will take hold of many hearts, that it will uh, help people to, to fervently start following after you so that uh, there's a movement that goes beyond the time that these members of our church will be spending in Cuba, but that goes uh, far into uh, the lives of the people who live there as the gospel takes hold of, of many and as the gospel spreads. And Lord, we pray for your protection as they go. We know that the enemy is at work. We know that he resists and works against those who are, are bringing the gospel to uh, hell's gates in many ways. Lord, so we just pray that uh, your spirit guide and protect our team, that you protect the people as they share, that you protect them over their travels, but uh, most of all, Lord, that you protect your word so that it's able to be proclaimed clearly and boldly in a way that will make a great difference for your kingdom. And so, Lord, we ask these many things in your name. We pray, amen. Will you stand again this morning as we continue to worship? I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me
children now you are the same God you are the same come on church you will answer now you are the same God you are the same come on church you were providing then you are providing now you are yesterday, today, and will be tomorrow. Amen. I feel like we need to just pause a second. and I know we've prayed already, but I don't think we could ever pray too much, right? As we sang that song this morning, the Spirit just imparted to me and impacted my heart. There might be somebody going through something this morning where you're calling out to the God of David. You're calling out on the God of Jacob. I need you, I need you now. And I don't know what that situation looks like in your life, but maybe you're desperate. Maybe you're in the middle of a situation. Maybe you're getting ready to go into a storm. You know, what, you know what's about to happen and you need the Lord now. Well, he hears his children now. So this morning, I'm just going to ask the band if you guys keep playing a little bit. And we're just going to enter into a time of prayer. If you want to come forward and pray this morning at these stairs, I'd encourage you to do so. If you want to sit down and pray. Maybe you know somebody in the room is struggling. And you want to go across the room to them. And you want to pray with them. You want to lift them up in prayer this morning. Whatever the, whatever the Lord is doing in your heart this morning, just pray. Take it to him. He hears you. You're not alone, church. He hears you. He wants you to cast your burdens on him. So this morning, over the next few minutes, let's just pray. Let's just pray. Maybe you're on the mountaintop of life and God is doing awesome things. Pray for those you know that are struggling, that need to be lifted up in prayer. Let's lift each other up this morning in prayer.
Father, the peace that comes with knowing that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever, is inexplicable. We can stand firm on your faithfulness. You've been faithful through generations. You will always be faithful. Father, I'm grateful that you, you heard your children then, and you hear us now. In whatever season of life we are in or going through, you hear your children. And Father, we cry out to you. We need you. We need you now. And Father, I'm oh so grateful that you hear. You hear, you listen, and you respond. So Father, as we, as we bow before you, your throne this morning, Lifting up our prayers, we're grateful. We're grateful that you hear us. Father, we don't know how you're going to answer our prayers, but Father, we can stand firm in knowing that you will answer our prayer. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Lord, as we open up your word, over these next few minutes and we're assured again of your faithfulness. God, may we lean into the teaching this morning. What a blessed opportunity do we, that we have to gather freely this morning to learn from your word, to lift songs of praise, to gather together in a voice of one and lifting a prayer. God, I thank you. Thank you that we can learn more about you and grow closer to you. It's in your precious and matchless name I pray. Amen.
I can't see you. Wow, those lights got bright. <laughs> Let me just ask. I'll lean a little bit uh, lower. Anybody else just need that this morning? Spirit just needed that this morning. I'm so thankful for a pastor and friend like Tim uh, who follows the, the leading of the Spirit. Are you guys thankful for that? Man, I'm thankful for that. I, here's the thing. I, I believe we serve... I believe we serve an incredibly big God. And I don't believe in coincidence. I believe that God is often orchestrating the circumstances of our life, providing what we need, protecting against the flaming darts of the evil one as scripture asserts that he, he does through that shield of faith that we're able to hold as we put on his armor. I believe that God is often working behind the scenes to work in our hearts and our lives in ways that we may not even fully understand or fully comprehend to bring about his good purposes in our life, to draw us nearer in our reliance on him, to help us walk more boldly the life of faith that he has called us to as his children. I believe God does that. This morning I was just thinking, as we were singing the lyrics to that Final song, the same God. Oh, man, I need this. I need this reminder. And as I thought about needing that reminder, my mind and my heart, they were drawn back to our deacon meeting this morning. We met as a group of, of uh, our, I should say I met with our group of deacons that are serving you as the body of Christ. And uh, two things happened in that meeting. Number one, uh, Gary, our chairman, he just... Uh, uh, so this is something God has been laying on his heart, and he challenged us to be reminded of the ways that God was leading us throughout this past year. We wrote down a number of things and, you know, turned it in. I don't know what the grade is, Gary. I have no clue. <laughs> but I'm thankful you did that. And Josh Tucker, one of our deacons, he led in devotion this morning, and he, he was uh, sharing with us uh, just a reminder of uh, Winter Bible Conference that happened three years ago. And he needed that reminder today, and I believe we needed that reminder today. And the quote from Winter Bible Conference as he was thinking on uh, the book of Hebrews, pointing to the book of Hebrews, which we're going to be in in just a minute, was uh, a quote from my friend Rob Wilton. He said, reflective praise inspires future perseverance. And I love that. To be reminded that God has been faithful in our lives. Amen. Because there's going to be moments where we're going to wonder and we're going to doubt. We're going to be prone to let anxiety and fear and dread and worry overwhelm our hearts and our minds and zap us of our strength, where we won't be able to put foot in front of foot. And we need to be reminded that God is faithful, that he is for us. That it is his word that sustains us. And by the way, that he who is faithful to begin a good work in you, according to scripture, will be faithful to bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We need reminded of who Jesus is. That we would fix our eyes upon him. That we would be overwhelmed by his goodness to us. That we would be able to let the things of the world grow strangely dim. 
as we gaze upon the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who is our hope. How we would know his salvation. That the one who saved our soul is also he who is able to save us from whatever we face in this moment. Let me ask you this, church. Very similarly to when those four friends lowered their friend through the roof and Jesus heals him, says, pick up your mat and walk. And there were some who wondered, who were going like, how, how could you do this? How could you say you are free from sin, pick up your mat and walk? And he says, well, which is more impressive? To say your sin's forgiven or to pick up your mat and walk? By the way, the more impressive thing was the forgiveness of sins. He says, but you, so that you know that I can forgive sins, go ahead and pick up your mat and walk. So let me ask it to you this way. He that forgave your sin, is he also able to meet you in whatever you need today? So that's where the book of Hebrews is leading us. That he who is able is also to meet us where we need him to meet us today. That is what the book of Hebrews, the entirety of the book, is leading us to think about, to reflect upon. That we would be inspired to remain faithful even in the midst of a world that is recognizably dark, chaotic, turning away from God. But that is not to be you, and that is not to be me. We need reminded of who Jesus is, and we need reminded of what Jesus has done for us. So when we're considering the book of Hebrews and the places that we have been, we've been reminded through those first seven chapters that Jesus is greater than the angels because God calls him his son. That Jesus is greater than Moses and the promised land and the law. That Jesus is greater than the priesthood and the sacrifices. And all that leads us to chapters 8 through 10. Yes, I said three chapters, just so you are aware. That leads us to chapters 8 through 10. And if you have your Bibles, and I, I hope you do, I want you to turn with me to chapters 8 through 10. Because the author of Hebrews is giving his final big point of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done before he begins to draw us into some conclusions for our lives. That Jesus is greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than the law, greater than the priesthood, greater than the sacrifices. And in chapters 8 through 10, he reminds the readers, these Jewish Christians, that Jesus is also the one who provides a better covenant for us. And that might not sound very impressive. For those of us who have been followers of Jesus for some time, your mind might easily pass over this idea, this concept that Jesus provides a better covenant for us and not give it much thought. Or you might be tempted to just simply say, of course he provides 
a better covenant for us without remembering or recognizing the context of the letter that we're reading. That these were Jewish believers living in the first century in the years, first several decades after Jesus walked the earth and died on the cross and rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. And the apostles go out and they're persecuted for their faith. They're even killed for being people who have given their lives for Jesus Christ. And they could have looked out on the setting and this idea that Jesus provides a better covenant for us might have been something that in the midst of their distress was hard for them to see at the moment. Have you been there? Maybe not in those words. Where you say, I know Jesus has done this. I believe Jesus has done this, but I don't feel it's right now. I don't see it right now. I know I can trust Jesus, but I'm struggling right now. Furthermore, we can recognize that for these Jewish believers from the time they were old enough to learn much of anything at all, that the Old Testament special covenant that God had made with his people, their ancestors, the people of Israel, was taught to them and revered by them. It's a little bit like changing tradition in a Baptist church. It's a scary thing. We also ought to remember this letter was fully intended to be read in one sitting. Really, it was intended to be read, preached at one time. If you read the book of Hebrews out loud from start to finish, the one sermon would take 45 minutes. It's kind of why we break it up. Not only just because of the length of time, but to be honest, it's because there's an incredible amount of depth and knowledge of Jewish history that the author, author expects you to understand. And so much like we do with most, most texts of scripture here at Highland Heights, we divide it into smaller sections so that we can ask two basic questions. Number one, what did the author mean in that context to the particular group of people that he is writing? And number two, how do I apply this truth to my life today? And we wanna do that as we read chapters eight through 10 this morning. It's a larger chunk of scripture, but we're going to rapid fire go through it so that we can get to where I believe the author of the book of Hebrews desires for us as readers generations later to understand who Jesus is and to understand the implications of this truth in our lives today. Somebody say amen. So he opens up with this. Jesus establishes a better covenant. Beginning in, ch in chapter 8, verse 1, he says this. Now the main point all right? Normally, when somebody says, this is the main point, they're trying to clue you in that this is something that you ought to understand, that this is something that you ought to grasp, that this is something that you ought to pay attention to. And really, what I want you to hear is that the author of the book of Hebrews is going to begin with this statement. Now, the main point is this, and I'm going to point it out in just a second. And he's going to bookend it at the end of chapter 10 with your understanding that because this is the main 
pinpoint. Because of this truth about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, the implications of our life are real and ought to be lived out. Now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, a true, the true tabernacle that was set up by the Lord and not by man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. We covered that last week. Therefore, it was necessary for this priest, being Jesus, also to have something to off- offer. Now if he were here If he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest since there are those offering gifts prescribed by the law. These serve as a copy of the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle for God said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. In other words, everything that was being done by the Levitical priesthood was simply foreshadowing what Christ was going to accomplish in establishing the new covenant. Everything about the old covenant was foreshadowing what Christ was going to accomplish in the new covenant. And in verse six, he really gets to the main point, but Jesus has now obtained a superior ministry and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been established on a better promise. The early Jewish Christians wavering back and forth in the midst of persecution, remembering the Jews had great freedom in practicing their faith. But to be followers of Jesus and to fully give themselves to following Jesus, they put themselves in a place in the crosshairs of Rome where they could be torn apart, where many were torn apart because they put their faith in Jesus. And so the author establishes this right at the beginning. This is the main point. Jesus is better. He provides the better covenant. If you have what is better, why would you return to what is worse? It's almost like this. If you were driving a beat up old car, call that like a hoopty back in the day, right? You're driving that And somebody gives you brand new, this is maybe just for me, like brand new, like Corvette Stingray, right? All the bells and whistles. I go, I wouldn't be caught dead going back to the old. (laughs) Why would you go back to what is old? Why would you go back to what is unsatisfying when Jesus has provided the better way? And the next several points that the author of Hebrew makes in this section are supporting points to this claim that Jesus has established the better covenant. The first thing he does to say this is he quotes from Jeremiah 31 verses, I'm sorry, Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. And he says, be reminded, you who know the scripture, that Even your prophets of old promised that a new covenant was coming. And why would they have promised that a new covenant is coming if a new covenant wasn't needed and a new covenant wasn't better? And so he says it this way in verse 7. We'll continue through verse 13. For if the first covenant had been faultless, saying the old covenant didn't suffice, there would have been no occasion for a second one. But finding fault with his people, God says, through Jeremiah, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I showed no concern for them, says the Lord, because they did not continue in my covenant. He says, I've kept my part. You haven't kept your part, but I'm still going to make a new covenant with you that you can have 
what I desire for you. For this covenant in verse 10, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not teach his fellow citizen and each, uh, and each his brother or sister saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will have forgiven their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. And by saying this, the author of Hebrews says, a new covenant, he has declared that the first is obsolete and what is obsolete and growing old is about to pass away. And he basically is looking at the church and saying, you can't go back. Don't go back. I beg of you, don't go back to what is no good. I beg of you, don't don't go back to what is obsolete. I'm begging you to understand that Jesus is a better covenant and this covenant has been promised. This is the setup for where he's bringing his conclusion. Any volleyball fans in the room this morning? I was kind of hoping for a few more. I saw on Facebook, Rustburg High School will play in the state quarterfinals for like the fourth or fifth straight year. It seems pretty cool. So I was hoping for a few more, (laughs) but that's okay. I really think this is a lot like the set. The ball is going up in the air and the author is ready to spike it down to make the point. It's decisive and definitive and declarative that we understand what he's doing. He says, if there was no need for a new covenant, then one wouldn't have been promised. And then he goes and he points out in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, the necessity of that new covenant. He says it this way. Now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and earthly sanctuary. In other words, that the first covenant had all these limitations. He says, for a tabernacle was set up in the first room, which is called the holy place, where the lampstand and the table and the presentation loaves, and behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. So you got the holy place and the most holy place, and it had a gold altar, the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered with gold on all sides, in which a a gold jar containing manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant, the cherubim of glory were above the Ark, overshadowing the mercy seat, and it It's not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. In other words, I could focus and break down on the meaning of all of these things, but that's not the point that the author is trying to make. So don't get sidetracked. He says in verse 6, With these things prepared like this, the priest entered the first room repeatedly performing the ministry regularly entering this room, but the high priest alone, the one person alone, enters the second room, the most holy place, the holy of holies, does so once a year and never without blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people that they had committed in ignorance. In other words, like we said last week, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, day after day after day after day, year after year after year after year were made. And the author of Hebrews says, and all of this, all of this, we intuitively understood, even if we couldn't put words to, did not accomplish its full effect. Listen to what it says in verse eight. It says, now through these things, the Holy Spirit was making it clear that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. Like, mind blown if you're a Jew, okay? Because what he had just said is that the way into the very presence of God, which they thought resided in the Holy of Holies really truly had not been fully disclosed even while the tabernacle still stood. Even while the offerings were going on. 
And again, back to that foreshadowing, he says this, for this is a symbol for present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. In other words, you intuitively knew that slaughtering the bull on the altar in the tabernacle truly did not cleanse you for the forgiveness of sins. The Jew understood this. It's stated in Romans that Abraham receives righteousness, is declared righteous by God, what? By faith. Not by the sacrifices. They are physical regulations and only deal with food and drink and various washings imposed until the time of the new order. All of those things were pointing to Jesus Christ. Why would you go back to the old? He continues in through this passage, reminding the people that the old covenant was limited. It was limited to time. It was limited to place. It was limited to people. It was limited by an officiant. It was limited in results. Verse 9, it truly did not cleanse the heart of the worshiper. There was something entirely insufficient and unsatisfying. They knew it, even if they couldn't put a finger on it. In verses 11 through 22, it covers the blessings of the new covenant. And just point these out. It says in verse 11, but Christ has appeared as high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made of hands. That is not of this creation. Verse 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of young cows sprinkled, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctifying for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. Therefore, he's the mediator of the new covenant. In other words, he says in these verses, Christ accomplished what we could not, that we would be made right with God. In chapter nine, verses 23 through 28, it tells us that Christ is the fulfillment of the covenant. In verse 25, it says he did not do this to offer himself many times as many high priests entered the sanctuary yearly with blood, with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time and at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by sacrifice sacrificing himself. Here's what the author is saying. Christ died once and for all. To accomplish what you and I could never accomplish on our own. That we couldn't make ourselves right with God in any other way, but through faith in Jesus Christ, we can be made right with God. Our sins can be forgiven and we are promised eternal life. And that can be true of anyone how we might be saved. In chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, it gives the conclusion of the old covenant. It's not needed and put away. For what it had been set to accomplish, it accomplished, namely pointing to the greater covenant and Jesus Christ. And finally, he gets to the application part. And it's really interesting because we kind of want people to cut to the chase. Sometimes my kids will be telling a story. It seems like it goes on and on and on and on. You might feel that they get that honestly. But he gets to the point as he's wrapping up chapter 10. He gets to the application of the new covenant. I just want to read this to you. I think it's so good. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, for he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through the flesh, his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. He says, you can trust what Jesus has done. You can draw near to God in full assurance of faith. 
a heart that is truly sprinkled clean, not by the blood of bulls and lambs, but by the blood of the Son of God. From an evil conscience, while we were sinners, Christ died for us, and bodies washed in pure water, by faith receiving the righteousness of God. Let us draw near to God with that full assurance. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. In the midst of a chaotic world, we can trust in Jesus. In the midst of circumstances that are overwhelming, that are beyond our control, we can trust in Jesus. We can declare his goodness even when things don't feel good. We can trust in Jesus. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Started the sermon out by sharing that quote that Josh Tucker shared with us, reflective praise inspires future perseverance. Do you remember what Jesus has brought you through? Just wanted to give you a moment. This isn't, this isn't something to quickly pass over. This is a moment in your life that you thought, I don't even know if I can go on. Consider that moment. Consider how Jesus led you through that moment. Consider his goodness to you. Consider the strength he gave you. Consider the peace that enveloped you. Consider the prayers of the saints that supported you. Consider God's goodness to you, even though it didn't feel good then. And recognize because of who Jesus is, and recognize because Jesus is faithful that just as he brought you through that, he is able to bring you through this too. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. We don't need to fear. We don't need to doubt. We don't need to worry. We don't need to let anxiety creep in. We don't need to be overwhelmed because God's got this too. He is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works that we would remind ourselves that even in the midst of trying times, God has called him, us to himself and he has called us to his good purposes. As a part of the body of Christ, to love one another well and to carry out his mission very little else matters for eternity. But this matters significantly. So don't neglect to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching, let us draw near, let us hold on, let us provoke to love and good works. Let us not neglect coming together because God is in this He's over this. He's got this, even in the midst of the chaos of our world. Even in the midst of the overwhelming circumstances of our life. And he wraps all of this up. Jesus has established a new covenant. So we have the warning. There's warnings throughout the book of Hebrews, and this is the warning of the new covenant. You can find it in 10 verses 26 through 39. For time's sake, I'm not going to read it all, but I want to read verse 37 and going forward. He says this, for yet in a very little while, the coming one will come and he will not delay. Jesus is returning for his people. Will he find us, his people, his righteous ones, living by faith or shirking back? Boldly proclaiming or having gone strangely silent? 
looking toward the day or living like the world. My righteous ones, the author of Hebrew reminds us, will live by faith. And if he draws back, God declares, I have no pleasure in him. Do we want to please God with our lives? Then we must not be people who draw back. And the author of Hebrews reminds you that if you are in Christ Jesus, you are not that person. Listen to how he finishes. But we, you and I, are not those who draw back and are destroyed. We are those who live by faith and we are saved. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but I do know that God has it all under control. Can I just confess something to you as your preacher, as your pastor? I don't always feel that way myself. But I know God is faithful. I know he is good. I know he has this. And oftentimes, like the soldier who encounters Jesus, I pray the simple prayer, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Maybe that's you this morning. You're going through it. And you simply need the reminder and the encouragement of the author of Hebrews that God is able to sustain you. That he is faithful to bring you through it. That he's got this. And so this morning you can come and cast your cares on him. Even as we've been doing all service long. Because he hears his children when they call Maybe this morning, you've been trying to do things on your own, kind of like the old covenant, trying to get good works so that you could be right with God, but good works don't make us right with God. The Bible actually declares that our own personal righteousness, the best we can do in and of ourselves, is as filthy rags before a holy God. But you can trust in Jesus. You can declare your faith in him. And as you do, God exchanges your sinfulness for Christ's righteousness. And in doing so, he places his spirit in you. He wipes the filth of sin out of you. Not that you won't fall, but that you're forgiven. And he promises eternity awaits you if you'll trust in him. This morning, if you'd like to trust in Jesus, if you'd like to cry out, carry your burden to him, we invite you to the altar as we sing and as we respond to God's word today. Will you stand with us, church, this morning as we sing?
sing that chorus again one more time one name is higher let's lift our voices one name is higher one name is stronger than any grave than any throne Christ exalted over all the only Savior Jesus Messiah, to you alone all praise belongs, Christ exalted over all, to you alone all praise belongs, Christ exalted over To him alone all praise belongs. Amen. Amen. Well, before we dismiss this morning, just a couple of things we want to share with you. Thank you for being with us. If you're new to Highland Heights, we're, we're grateful you're here. Yeah, go ahead and take a seat because we remember we've got our, we're going into our uh, special called business meeting right after this. So yeah, take a seat. So if you're, if you're uh, new to Highland Heights, thanks for joining us. Grateful that you are here. There's a QR code in the back of the seat in front of you. That's actually going to take you to some information about who we are. And if you want to find out more about who we are, there's a spot where you can fill out your name and email, and we'll get in touch with you this week and uh, answer any questions that you might have. But we're grateful that you're here this morning. also want to share with you uh, this month... Uh, our adult ministry is the ministry of the month. So over the past few months, we've been doing ministry of the month. This month, our adult ministry, and there's all kinds of things going on. Young adults, men's ministry, women's ministry, senior adults, all of it. So we put together this really cool graphic. There's a lot going on. So we put together this really cool graphic that you can see that's going to kind of bring all that together and help you get all that information. There it is. <laughs> HHBC.net slash events. All right, so go ahead and check that out. But in all seriousness, uh, there is a lot going on, and we would really, it's going to help you out, help us out a lot. If you're checking that regularly, you can go to the website or on the app. If you have the app at the bottom on the dock there, the tray, there's the events tab. You can go ahead and, and tap on that and scroll through the different events. But a few upcoming events is our young adults have a thanks miss dinner coming up. Uh, our men's ministry is going to go to an LU hockey game here in the upcoming weeks. And our women's ministry has a simulcast coming up. You're going to want to get all the events details and everything there at slash events, all right? And uh, also, again, just a reminder, right after we're done here, we're going to go into a short 
business meeting, a special call business meeting. And uh, yeah, I like it. Hey, man, what a great morning. Great morning to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hey, let's go ahead and stand up. Let's read our verse together, and then we'll go. <laughs> hey, I, I, I can't lie. I, I hit the panic button a little bit earlier. When we got done, you know, the spirit hits you, and I'm like, man, we need to pray this morning. And then Pastor Josh, this is the longest message in our series. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I need you. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. All right, here we go. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. He is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great week, church. We'll see you next Sunday right after we're done our business meeting.